Well, good day, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Well, it's the afternoon here, and of course the light is coming from this angle here, but this morning I was out here in the courtyard working on practicing with my Afghan box camera. This is a project that I started, I think it was about five years ago, and I haven't used the Afghan box camera in probably over a year. And so I decided this year, I really want to start using it. And so practice is essential. And so this morning I set up the whole rig and had a few misstarts and mishaps and everything. And when I'm doing things like this, I generally don't like to record video as I'm doing it simply because it usually takes all my attention just to get what it is I'm trying to do done right, and then having to shoot video at the same time, it's just impractical for me as a one-man operation here. So I'm gonna just uh, recreate kind of what I did. I'm gonna describe for you how the Afghan box camera works, and we'll look at some of the results. Stay tuned. Well, the box itself has a side opening lid. The whole side of the camera opens up. It's secured by a couple of gate latches. It pulls off like that. And I transport all the accessories, or a lot of the accessories, in the box. This bin, stuff like that. This is my paper safe box. It has a little support thing that you can prop it up like that. And I can take the lid off with one hand inside the box like that to gain access to my paper. And that goes in the middle, right here. I currently use two compartments or two containers uh, for chemicals. That's the fixer. This is the developer. Uh, the developer tray has some hot glue gun pieces on it so that it helps elevate the print slightly off the bottom of the container so I can get it with one hand in the box when it's being developed. So that goes there. The lens is in the front here and uh, I'm using a Fujinon 135 f 5.6 lens. So when the box is being stored in the garage I like to keep dust out of it so I have this blank piece of foam board and I can push the foam core board out like that. Then we will insert the lens, put this wooden spacer right here. This uh, lens board will also fit on my Speed Graphic and my Intrepid, so I can use the same lens on these three different applications. This little bracket here just holds the little spacer in place, which holds the lens in place like that. So next, I would pour developer and fixer. Developer I'm using currently is LPD developer diluted around 1 plus 4 or 1 to 3. Uh, I'm using grade 2 resin coated paper. I like the semi-matte finish for both the negatives and the prints. It's important to level the tripod head right here. And the main reason why I want to level it is to keep the chemicals from being sloshing around too badly. Okay, there is a focusing rod that moves the film plane back and forth on these two rods. Focus is set with a bulldog clip so the focusing rod can only pull back as far as the bulldog clip permits like that for instance and that would be a preset distance that I've already established before when I set up the camera so I can push the film holder all the way to the front for handling the paper and then when I'm ready and then I load the paper, then I can pull it back to the preset position ready to go. So I'll show you how I load the paper. I don't actually have any paper in the paper safe right now, but just to demonstrate the film holder, it has a screw eye right here that's in a slot. And when it's in the vertical position, it enables me to pull the frame that holds the ground glass down and it only goes down as far as horizontal is set up by this string here that keeps it from going any further. And this little area right here is where the paper sits in. So I'm using a piece of cardstock here just to demonstrate uh, how the loading procedure goes. 
So I'm going to lift up the box and put the little piece of wood underneath it to angle the lid up toward me. Now I can take the lid off with one hand, he says, like that. I pull the paper out and I can set it on top of the box. It's, it's emulsion side down right now. I open up the ground glass. I flip the paper around. So I take the piece of paper, emulsion side facing to the front, and I set it here into the film gate area, making sure it's sitting on the base there on the ground glass, even on the sides, and then I can fold up the ground glass, and then I turn this screw eye here to lock it in place, and then I can slide it temporarily all the way forward. Okay, once the paper is loaded in the film plane, I can take the lid and one-handedly, theoretically, put the lid back on like that, and then I set it up so it sits flat like that. And now I can pull the ground glass back to the preset focus position, and I can slide this door closed, which enables me to pull my arm out without fogging the paper. So after the exposure is made, I will take the door and slide it open. I will move the film plane back a little bit to the front to give me access. I pull open the ground glass door, or the ground glass, I get the paper. There's a temporary position right to the left of here that I can store the film, the paper, till I get the ground glass all the way to the front to its rest position and then I can grab the paper and put it in the developer tray and start my processing. And the nice thing about this setup is if at any time I want to take my arm out I can simply close the door and I can take my arm out safely without fogging the paper. I usually keep a wadded up several pieces of paper towel in the arm sleeve right here that I can use to wipe my fingers off because I will get them in the chemicals uh, in the developer certainly. So I usually develop for about three minutes. When it's fully uh, developed I transfer it to the fixer tray on the other side here and then I can close the door, pull my arm out, and then I give it probably 10 or 20 seconds enough for the acidity of the fixer to stop the developing so the paper won't get fogged. And then I can open up the door and then I have my negative here that I can watch it, look at it as it's fixing. I can see how it looks like and immediately tell if it's good or not. Okay, so the printing easel arm is a piece of inch and a half by quarter inch poplar that you get from the hardware store. This is the, the setup I'm using. And I have a quarter 20 elevator bolts that sit underneath the camera on the base. And I just uh, secure these in place with a couple thumb screws. And then the actual easel itself is this piece of wood with a plate of steel on here that enables magnets to stick to it. And I can put this easel right here. I can adjust the distance for how much magnification I want on the actual image. And I can also adjust the focus to whatever I set this to. So the way I set this up is I have a sheet of flexible magnet and I have a piece of adhesive vinyl. I have a black one and a gray one. So I'll put the negative here upside down and I can sandwich it with the oval shaped mask like that if I want an oval shaped uh, border around my face. And I can adjust the position of this laterally and up and down to center it appropriately to the lens itself. And then looking through the back door, I can draw the focus in and out until I get proper focus on that image on the ground glass and the proper size and composition. And then I will set my bulldog clip appropriately right here. Well, it's a fun little process, and today's uh, practice session, I was using grade two semi-matte RC paper for both the negative and the print. And I like grade two paper because I get better control over the contrast, unlike multi-grade paper. 
I have in the past, however, used multi-gray paper for the print. Now the advantage that that gives you is I can put contrast control filters when I'm doing the printing and I can alter the contrast of the final print and it gives me more control. But today's experiment was just using the same paper for both the negative and the print. I like the semi-matte finish for this reason that you're going to be outdoors. I do like to use the camera itself in shaded daylight, kind of prevent the obvious glare of direct sun. And the semi-matte finish of the paper negative helps to prevent that kind of glare so you can get a nice clear image without any reflection. Now the top of the camera does give me some storage area for putting accessories in, but I really need more area than just that. And so I have a makeshift shelf that I can install. So two of the shelf panels, there's this one with a notch cut in it for the front leg, and this one that has a notch for the uh, top of the tripod head. These two sit like this, and what attaches them together is I have some of these fender nuts with, these are furniture feet, but they act like thumb screws, and I basically join them together like this, as such. So I intend on eventually being able to make finished prints for people and give them to them on the spot. In order to do that, they have to be dried. So I have this transparent, kind of more like translucent uh, Tupperware style container. And what I have in here is a heavy plate of steel that's been painted black. And if I leave this out in the sun with the lid on and aimed toward the sun, um, in a matter of maybe a half hour or less, this will get up to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the box. And I stick the paper to the plate with magnets and it dries them quite well after they've been squeegeed with the film squeegee. So also to present the finished prints to the person receiving it, I've printed these little folders out of gray cardstock. I call it Luna Plata Silver Gelatin Street Portraits by Joe Van Cleve. I have print exposure information on the back here as a reference. It's folded, has a rounded corners, and it says, this is a silver gelatin optical print of a camera miniatura paper negative prepared in the same manner as the traditional street portraitists of old by photographer Joe Van Cleve. So it's a little way to present these pictures to the public. Well, today's session with the Afghan box camera was really intended for me to kind of get back in the swing of practicing with it. There's a lot of detailed operations you have to do in a certain order, a certain sequence, that if you don't do it right, you can fog the paper, do all kinds of mistakes. And it's a little more complicated than even large format photography uh, because you have two stages to it. You are not only doing the negative, but you're printing, you're loading and unloading paper in the box, in and out of the uh, film gate, into the developer and fixer, etc., etc. There's a lot of things to go wrong, so I just wanted to start practicing with it. I wanted to mention I'm using my Seconic L308 meter, and I rated the uh, Freestyle Photo Arista brand resin-coated grade two semi-matte finish paper at an, an ISO or an exposure index of 12. I know to rate it at ISO 12 based on my past experience with grade two paper. And so I set my meter to 12. I was using the incident metering so that you set it in front of your subject and meter pointing back to the camera lens. And my lens on the camera, I was operating at wide open at 5.6 for most of these shots. So I would just adjust the shutter speed on the Fuji lens accordingly to get that exposure. Pretty straightforward metering. So when I first set up the camera it was in a different part of the front porch and I did this one test exposure and it looked actually all right but I had all this bright uh, light sunlight on part of my face and this was just going to make a terrible portrait so I had to move the whole rig closer to the front courtyard wall to get in the shade and then the next 
portrait I made, I gave it a little bit more exposure on the negative, but I did get a little bit of sunlight creeping over on the top of my head again. So although it was a good exposure overall, this was not unacceptable. This would make a terrible looking print. I also noticed I had a couple little scratches right here from handling and a little bit of fogging right there. So finally, I repositioned the uh, Afghan box camera in my chair a little bit better. I only got a little bit of sunlight on top of my hair there, on top of my head, but overall it was good, and exposure was good, focus was good. So you might notice here, if I was to focus in closer, that on these negatives, you see my the shadow detail in my eye socket. So this is common with portraits in this kind of lighting where my eye sockets are shaded by my eyebrows and so you can barely see any detail in the eyes there. But what's interesting about this is this is a negative image and so now this faint detail of the shadows is one of the brightest things on my entire face. And so when you re-photograph this with another piece of photo paper these eyes that were dark show up really good because they're really bright in the negative. This was my first negative. I gave it an exposure of a quarter second at f8 and I was a little bit displeased with the density of the shadows. They weren't quite as dark as I wanted, but what's interesting is you can see how the eyes open up. Uh, and that's just an interesting phenomenon how that works. When you're re-photographing a paper negative with another piece of paper, you really can get that shadow detail in there to reveal itself. And this is one of the things I've been fascinated with about the Afghan box camera process. Again, you do see this little glancing ray of light on my hair, which makes it not a perfect portrait, of course, but it's just an experiment or a test. Uh, a little bit of miscentering here on the paper as it sat in the film gate, and then there's a little bit of scratching here as the heavy magnets I was using to dry these in my solar power drying box scratch the paper a little bit. I'm going to have to work on that, but it wasn't too bad of a picture, just a little bit underexposed for the print. You might notice the edge of the image is slightly soft here, just the way the shadows form on the edge of the frame. Afterwards, I increase the exposure from f8 to just above f6, f5.6, like around f6. And this was a good exposure. I still have detail in my eyes, but the density of the shadows is more acceptable. And this is a nice picture. Look at the, the sharpness or the detail in my fleece lining and my hoodie jacket there. So this is a interesting picture and what I love about it is it's grade 2 paper, the same paper that the negative was made from and it comes out nice in shaded daylight which is really good because this semi-matte finish, you see how it doesn't have the shiny glare that you would get off a glossy negative it just makes it so much easier to re-photograph as a negative and then the finished print I think looks nicer, I prefer these kind of matte or semi-matte finish pictures for black and white portraits, they just look nice. Well you can probably expect uh, throughout this year I will continue to do more experiments and tests with the Afghan box camera and when I do so I'll try to uh, share my experience and my results. I don't want to be too repetitive of course but I, as I advance my technique and find new findings and all that. I, I do want to share it with you. There's a lot of people out there that are interested in Afghan box cameras and what I've noticed about them is most of the information on the Afghan box cameras and most of the experience comes from people in the non-English speaking world. Uh, basically South America, like Brazil, Argentina, Cuba, Afghanistan of course, um, Spain, Germany, France, those kind of places, uh, India, South Asia, India and Pakistan, places like that, there's a lot of experienced photographers working with this technology, not so much in the United States, ironically, considering all the other kinds of photographic activity that are happening. So it's interesting, uh, there are no real accessible Afghan box camera kits being made uh, available in the United States that I know of. Uh, th there's a few photographers working on these projects along with me. So every one of these box cameras is kind of a unique design. My camera I designed, as I indicated earlier, 
a little over five years ago, um, designed for these pictures that are slightly smaller than 4x5. They're roughly about 4x4. It's a fairly small camera box. Mine uses the internal focusing inside the box, and the advantage of that particular focusing method is it enables you to do a lot more close-up focusing when you're doing the printing step because you have a lot more focus draw on the rails inside the camera. Uh, the other style of Afghan box camera has a folding camera with a bellows mounted to the front of the box and you're only you're limited by the focusing length of the bellows as far as printing. So I think this internal focusing system gives you more options when you're printing like you can zoom in on the faces and blow those up bigger and stuff like that. So they're all one-off designs. There is no standardized Afghan box camera designs that I've seen although there are in some countries there are craftspeople making these cameras in serial fashion so there are like small craftsmen that are working and making their own versions but all the different versions of Afghan box cameras are all different which is interesting you know I have ideas for vertical chemical tanks in the bottom of the camera more of a vertical standing box camera instead of a horizontal thing you know there's all kinds of things you could do with this technology that have been done and they've been around for probably a century or more if this was interesting to you, I'd love to hear your comments down below. Drop any questions uh, down there also. I'll be happy to answer them if I can. And you guys stay creative and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye.